Refugees are people whose motivation for movement is fear. To get away from. Of course, they also care for where they get to. But that's the secondary question. As kids, I don't think we realize the intensity of the danger. We had no stillsitzen gelernt, überall. Aus Angst still sein hier und da und überall. Man ist immer gehemmt. Man muss aufpassen, was man sagt, was man denkt. Die Gedanken, die gehen sogar. Stalin. Stalin did it. The whole time we were fleeing from the Russians. And this meant to us Mennonites, you know, we we're going to be free. For Joseph Stalin, 1947 was a year to celebrate. Over the past two decades, he had consolidated his power over the Soviet Empire while overseeing a massive social and economic overhaul. After being nearly defeated in 1942, with the German army just miles outside of Moscow, the Soviet army would rally despite costing the lives of 20 million Soviet citizens, the Soviet army and the industry behind it had become an almost unstoppable force rolling through Germany. The big three had won the war, but Stalin had taken the ultimate war trophy in the German capital of Berlin. His relationship with the West, however, had gone cold. The Americans' presence in Europe countered the Soviet army and Berlin, now divided by the Allied victors, had become a source of constant friction between the two emerging superpowers. There was also a refugee problem. Spread throughout Germany and Western Europe were masses of Soviet citizens. Some had been taken as slave labor during the war, but many had fled west with the retreating German army, desperate to escape Stalin. Stalin wanted all his people back, and that included soldiers, included Cossacks, German Lutherans, German Catholics. He wanted Mennonites. He definitely thought that they were traitors to the homeland and that they should be punished for that. The war is over, and these Mennonites are hiding in Europe. If they're found, they're going to be shipped back to Russia. Into labor camps. They weren't allowed to go back to where Mennonites had originally lived. Women, children, elderly were just sent out into the gulags, into the forced labor camps, and forced to work. After World War II, there's thousands of Mennonites trapped in refugee camps in Holland, in Germany, and a large group in Berlin. American-administered section of Berlin with the Russian zone around them, a refugee situation of folks who are very afraid. The events that would follow would make international headlines involving countless aid workers, the Soviet and American high commands, and even a queen. But to understand the story of how these Mennonite refugees from the Soviet Union got there in the first place and why they were so desperate to never return, you need to go back in time. Three decades earlier, in Ukraine region of the Russian Empire, is where their story begins. The Mennonites living there were part of the larger religious movement that had originated in Holland centuries earlier as followers of the former Catholic priest, Menno Simons. They believed in adult baptism over child baptism and were pacifists, strongly believing in nonviolence. At its core, there's a belief in following Jesus, as Jesus as the example, nonviolence. They also spoke the German and Plautdeutsch, or Low German, languages. And because the Bible was translated into German, as well as German hymn books, that became a central anchor point for them. 
They wouldn't be ethnically German. They do now speak German. These Mennonites were originally drawn to Ukraine as a place free of religious persecution with exemption from military service. But after a century of peace and prosperity, everything would change. So in 1914, when the war began, there were probably about 120,000 Mennonites in Russia, Ukraine. They were pacifists, but allowed to do non-combat roles to support the larger effort. Mennonite men did alternative service, either working in the forests or working as medics on hospital trains. As the war progressed, the Mennonite colonies would find themselves occupied by the German Imperial Army. There was a cultural connection because of the shared language. Russia was in the midst of fighting Germany, but would plunge into a series of crippling revolutions, ending with the Communist Revolution, led by Vladimir Lenin forcing a peace with Germany. 1918, the war came to an end. Germany had to withdraw. There was no good government. Anarchy would overtake Ukraine. Led by the notorious bandit Nestor Makhno, the Mennonite colonies would then endure pillaging and murder at the hands of his bandits. Makhnovsky, who was not communist, but he was an anarchist. It was a big debate how to respond, and some finally did respond by creating a self-defense unit. So much chaos in South Russia, the war, then there was the revolution, then there was civil war with red and white armies battling each other and crossing. The front went through the Mennonite areas time and time again. The Red Army finally prevails, pushes Machno out, and Machno flees. And the Soviet Union becomes a new entity and a new government in Russia. And then the famine hits. It was a combination of drought. It also resulted from the Soviets confiscating a lot of grain, seed, food, draft animals, and so on. The Mennonites in Russia then decide they have to do something. They can't survive there. And so they send a delegation to North America to ask for aid and also to help for emigration. There was a meeting in the summer of 1920 in Elkhart, Indiana, that brought together representatives of numerous different Mennonite groups in North America. The Mennonites in Ukraine, they were desperate. They reached out to their uh, religious cousins. Some of them had close connections in Canada, others were more distant in the United States. There were other Mennonites, part of the larger movement in Europe, that centuries earlier had migrated to Pennsylvania, the American Midwest, and Ontario, Canada. There was also a group directly related on the Canadian prairies who had come from Ukraine only 50 years earlier. They were known as the Canadier. In the 1860s, the military exemption is threatened and they have to teach government curriculum in the schools in Russia. Some of the Mennonites in Russia figure this is not what we want. About a third of the Mennonites left Russia at that time. These groups in Ukraine, the United States, and Canada had never worked together. But the four young men representing the Ukrainian Mennonites facing famine would change everything. They insisted you have to work together. You have to create something central that will respond to this need. So out of that emerged this organization that is called the Mennonite Central Committee. And the very first thing was they went down the road from Elkhart, Indiana, where that meeting was, to the Mennonite College in the little town of Goshen, Indiana, and they found three young men who were students at Goshen College, and their task was to go to southern Russia, Ukraine, and verify that the story that they heard was indeed true. And they saw a lot of need. Women by the railroad tracks literally kneeling down, picking uh, every little bit of grain that fell from the uh, train cars as they trundled through their towns hitched as the draft animals in the plowing equipment so that they could farm. The main community started counting food and shipping food to the Ukraine to alleviate the shortage of food there. Setting up food kitchens for not just Mennonites, but for everybody. 
and then after the food was sent, sending a replacement for horsepower in the form of forts and tractors. There were other organizations doing similar work, so there were other folks helping other Russians, other Mennonites, but the Mennonite Central Committee, this newly formed organization, was among those responding to the need in Russia. Lenin establishes a new order, and it looks for a number of years as though things are maybe going to get better. But that's also when the Canadian Mennonite Board of Colonization in Canada arranges for immigration. Mennonites who came to Canada in the 1870s, they showed the government they were good farmers, they were good citizens. And that sets the stage for the immigration in 1923. Almost 20,000 Mennonites transported to Canada. It was a very difficult time for people to decide if they're going to leave. Many families are torn. They stay because they feel as if there is a future there. Some are stay because they don't have any opportunities. Some stay because of family reasons. They want to remain close to them and they think that they can negotiate with the Soviet government and figure out how to live under this new system. Then Lenin died and there was a power struggle between Stalin and Trotsky. The emigration ceases, and from then on, Mennonites really know that they're going to be in trouble. In 1929, a very desperate group of people, German Lutherans and Catholics and others, including Mennonites, thousands of them, they moved en masse to Moscow. They called it an emigration panic. And when the people here in America, especially in Canada, became aware of this, and they realized how grim it actually was becoming. Canada was not accepting any more Mennonites at that time either. And it was the German government who said, we'll take these people and we'll help them resettle elsewhere. There were no countries willing to take the Mennonites that were stranded in Moscow, with one exception. Just a few years earlier, a group of the Canadia from the Canadian prairies had been frustrated with the Manitoba government's involvement in their schools. They wanted autonomy, so they moved to Paraguay. Because the government was infringing on their rights to educate their children as they saw fit, the government said, sure, you can come to Paraguay, you can have your schools, religious freedom, but you gotta go to the Chaco, you gotta go to a place where there is not settlement, you gotta start over. The Chaco was dry, hot, and had never been farmed. Nevertheless, some 1,700 Mennonites from Canada would establish a colony there. In 1929, they're joined by the group of 1,000 who had fled to Moscow. Some men got out and got to Paraguay, but after that, the border was shut. They were at the mercy of Stalin. He believed that there was something called capitalist encirclement of the Soviet Union. It was not just a struggle between armies in the field, it was also the struggle between economies. The Soviet Union has to modernize. Isolated and lacking capital to embark on his ambitious plans, Stalin saw the peasant farmers as his solution. The collectivization had begun. Basically, peasantry would be expropriated. We'll have to subsidize the development of modern factories, modern industries in the Russian cities. You gave up your farms, you gave your implements, you gave up your homes to the collective, and Mennonites were part of that. Ukrainians strongly object to collectivization. To create collective farms, they had to get rid of the peasant resistance. Anyone who had been a more prosperous farmer, and almost all Mennonites would have been included in that category, was labeled a kulak, somebody who was a resistor, a counter-revolutionary. In Ukraine, also in Kazakhstan and other areas of the Soviet Union, grain will be requisitioned from the villages and the people won't have enough to live. The Holodomor was 
an attempt to break the will of the Ukrainian people and their opposition to collectivization. And you eliminate enough people that the rest will be cowed. For Ukraine, the most reliable estimates are almost 4 million people who died from starvation in 1932-33. I still remember the NKVD came and searched the whole house. They knocked on the walls, and then they found it right. And I was standing beside my dad, and then he said, you will give one pail of Stalin. Die Leute, die mussten fast verhungern. Und dann, wir gingen dann zur Schule. Und meine Schwester und ich, wir waren so elendig, wir bekamen jeder ein halbes Liter Milch. Dann haben wir Wasser rein. Und so haben wir überlebt als Familie. Spring came, we was going in the field, there was kind of a grass that we could eat, that we took and ate it. Mennonites were in part sheltered from hardship because they had connections with North America, with Germany. In fact, essentially the only thing that they were able to do after that point was send relief packages and money. It was a bit of a fraught situation because the packages could be looted. It was the Stalinist era and a very dark time for the church. My father, he was elected as a minister until the church was closed and all ministerial activity became impossible. Wurde Papa, Mama hat nachher, er durfte ja vorher nichts sagen, mit glühenden Nadeln unter die Nägel gespickt und er sollte den Glauben absagen. Und dann kam er wieder frei, aber er sollte nicht mehr predigen. Papa sagte, ich muss Gott mehr gehorchen als den Menschen. Und dann ging er wieder und predigte. The Bolshevik Revolution was based on the principle that religion is bad. It's an opiate of the people, based on a long history of oppression in Russia. And the church had been very complicit with the powers of the day, the czars, in oppressing the peasants. When Lenin came to power, he disenfranchised the church. And then when Stalin came to power, he was even much more brutal. The anti-religious crusade that he embarked on was not directed at Mennonites. It was directed at every church. There was nothing religious going on. There were no church services to attend. There were no Mennonite gatherings. Well, they couldn't aggravate the situation. It was bad enough as it was. We durften ja keinen Glauben dann haben. Und viele, sogar von unseren Mennoniten, gingen dann ums Haus und horchten abends, ob die Kinder beteten oder nicht, die Eltern mit den Kindern. Also man ist keinmal frei, man weiß nicht von wem, ob vom Bruder, vom Nachbarn, vom Freund bespitzelt wird. Jeder hat den Mond auf den Spielen. Die Leute nehmen dann für Klage oder die sind für den Geld. Our Mennonite teacher, she had to ask whether our family celebrated Easter, a great church festival, or, or Christmas, and she was to report that. Then I remember myself when my grandfather wie ich auf dem Schoß bei ihm saß und er erzählte mir die biblischen Geschichten. Und seine Töchter, die, sie waren zwei Tanten von meiner, wohnten mit ihm zusammen. 
die waren so schrecklich unruhig. Sie hatten Angst, der, der würde, die würden, würden sie nach Sibirien schicken. In the mid-1930s, Stalin becomes very paranoid and has a number of major purges. He thought that ends justified means in this case. And KVD, that the Russian abbreviation, they took people away. The mothers, they were asked, whom have they taken? They had seen the black car in the village. In the black car, that was the one that the people disappeared, the men, Black Raven. Father was arrested in 1935. I never saw him again. My father's name was Isaac. He was seen by someone in one of the concentration camps, but um, probably didn't survive much after that. My dad was actually taken in 37 and my mother was pregnant with me. So then she was left with six kids. I remember very well going to school. Everything was fine. I thought we had a good life. And one day the KGB came, opened the door wide, and he said, now I have to go too, because many fathers had been taken away of Eight cousins stood and cried until we saw our fathers loaded onto a half-ton truck, never to be seen again. Einfach Nacht kam die GPU mit Gewehr schlugen an die Tür, aufmachen und zum Mann einpacken, mitgehen, auf nimmer wiedersehen. Der Mayor from our town came and knocked on the window and said, open the door. And my father says to my mom, by the way, no, they are here. That's the end. And sure it was. We always said, you know, they were taken forever. And none of them came back. Most of them were shot a few days after their arrest. So during the Great Terror, almost a million people, right, over 800,000 executed in 1936-1938. But you have even greater number of people sent to the Gulag. Just short of 500 major camps in which people were sent to work. Located in all kinds of inhospitable places, more than five million people, convicts, working essentially for free as slave labor for the state in those labor camps. My father was arrested. I was 11 years old. That was between my sister and myself, five years difference. We were sent to Siberia. We had uh, no beds. The shell of the potatoes, baking them and cooking them, that was our food. Otherwise, we didn't have the food. Father died. We didn't have a funeral, nothing. My mother, she asked me, do we have a crust of bread? And I said, no. Then she said, my kid, not lady, she had not schlaf. So that's what I did beside her. And in the morning, I realized she had died. So early in the morning, my sister said, OK, now let's go to escape. So we walked for three days. And 
my sister said, which house do we knock on the door for help? And the lady opened the door and we asked for help. And she said, come on in. Went with a truck to the station where the train from Moscow. We found my aunt and there I stayed for 10 years. And my aunt, she well became my mother. She took care of me. We had been totally isolated from world news. Otherwise, uh, the news available to us were broadcast from a loudspeaker somewhere in a public place and were totally the news of the state. They took all the men from 60 to 60. Nobody seen them again. Oh, they would say, you know, the Germans were coming, the Germans were coming. And in the night, the German planes were bombarding. We had orders to organize, and we were on the way to Siberia. And, and then the uh, Germans start uh, shooting. I think the closest shell fell uh, maybe about 30 meters or so from our shelter. The machine gun stopped and it was quiet, very quiet. And then after a little while, there was a big bang. The hydro dam had been blown up. We could hear the waters rush five kilometers away. And uh, apparently thousands were swept away by this destruction of the dam. And all of a sudden we see three men coming, a machine gun and all that, so three German soldiers. And they came passing by, Hello. good morning. Was? Ich spreche Deutsch. Ah, ja. Came to the back door in and that I talked German to that guy. And he turns around and he said, here is a Russian Junge, der kann Deutsch sprechen. Actually, some officers knew that we were there, but this common soldier did not. There was a sense of tremendous relief that something had been lifted from us. Schon auf atmen von dem Druck vom Sowjet Regime, so dass wir dachten, jetzt sind wir frei. We were under the impression that Germany was a Christian country. Die ersten Soldaten, die kamen, die hatten hier and am Koppel, God mit uns. This was the old Germany that some of the people still knew from where they had received their German textbooks or their German Bibles and hymn books and other things. We were so froh, that we jetzt wieder frei beten und Andacht haben konnten. Germans, from their perspective, they view Mennonites as people that they can work with. Volksdeutsche, right? Ethnic Germans, not really German citizens. Slavs were not at the very, very bottom, but at the bottom enough. So they were not treated as decent human beings, right? They were labor and to work for the German masters. They took Ukrainians out of Ukraine and forced them to labor in Germany for their war effort. Und da wurden wir sehr gedrillt, oh, als Reichsdeutsche sollten wir dann Bunddeutscher Mädchen und ah, der ganze Drill da. They wanted to Germanize everything. My name started off as David. 
David was a Jewish name, and it was not very welcome with the, if I should use the name Nazis. As a child, I was called by the nickname Vicha, and that came close to Victor. A lot of the Mennonite men, when the war first starts, are serving in the Red Army, and they're serving as Soviet soldiers. Some of them will be, get captured and will switch sides. There was no question asked when they said they had to come and serve. And I was too young, but I was big enough to understand what was going on. Young men that are left in the Mennonite villages, they get snapped up by the German military, they're taken as German translators because of their knowledge of German and Russian. The whole business of how people under occupation survive is very complex. If you live under military occupation, you still have to stay alive. We see a variety of responses on the part of Mennonites. Young men joined the local police, as recent scholarship has shown, was involved in local atrocities, particularly against the Jewish population, but also against the Roma population. To Mennonites, watching everything unfold and feeling helpless that they can't help. A sense of sorrow associated with the Jewish population. In some cases, Mennonites had married Jews and there was a great disappointment among the adult population, like my mother and others, and they expressed that sometimes. I remember that at one time, an officer who stayed with us uh, said to mother, Mrs. Jansen, you can say these things, but for me, it would be very dangerous to do so, and you should be careful too. well-known battle is, of course, of Stalingrad, the famous battle that turned the events of the war. That then resulted in the evacuation of German-speaking people out of the Ukraine. We had to leave the whole village. Mostly women and children decided to go along they thought they knew what to expect once the Russian front came back into the villages. There was nobody who wanted to stay. Germany requisitioned trains to transport people westward, and that included not only Mennonites, but also Lutherans and Catholics, people of German descent. Packed into a, a long train of box cars. We were very fortunate that uh, we could reach West Prussia in 11 days. The people from the Molochna couldn't get trains anymore. Germany couldn't get trains for them. And they had to go on the Great Trek by horse and wagon. What three months it was on a road and get to, to Poland. Hitler intended that that area would become German. That's why he settled German-speaking people there. We were in camps. Once they won the war, they would use us to settle the empty areas there and so on. There were big buildings, large rooms, uh, bunk beds, uh, separated from each other for some privacy by blankets, reasonably good food. That's where I learned my first table grace. That was the first time I ever heard of that, of actually praying. Deutschland nach Polen, das von den Deutschen eingenommen war, da wurden wir deutsch eingebürgert. Von daher habe ich meine deutsche Staatsbürgerschaft, meine deutschen Dokumente. When I was in Poland, I get a letter from the army. I have three days time to report of not 
they would shoot me. They gave you the uniform and then you was there. You know, we had no choice. And uh, we only got the news that the Russians were expelled here, they expelled there. But we knew that the front was approaching and uh, the Red Army was coming closer and uh, that we would eventually have to flee. Generally, we were not organized, we ran. Und fast nur Frauen und Kinder. Meine Mutter, mein Bruder war neun Jahre alt. Die sind nur zu Fuß gegangen, dem Wagen hinterhergelaufen. We got a hold of a wagon that we pulled by hand. So all our belongings were on there. My mother wasn't well, so she sat on the wagon. Winter, December, it was an icy rain. And uh, we had only what we could carry. Well, we had virtually nothing. And from then on, it was a matter of outrunning the advancing Russian front. There were so many people on the road. One evening, the sun was setting down. Could hear already the Russian army. Suddenly, the Russian tanks came out of the forest and they cut the track off. All my cousins, aunts and Uma, they took back. The Russian tank came and drove over Uma. They drove over horses, everything they killed. No mercy. Und meine Mutter war auch mal im Schnee sitzen geblieben und konnte und wollte nicht mehr weiter, weil, weil sie auch total mutlos war. Aber dann kamen die anderen Frauen und nahmen sie unter den Arm und gingen mit ihr mit. Sie, sie hat eigentlich nur wegen der Kinder überlebt, das alles überlebt. Ein russischer Soldier kam. Er sagte, are you Niem are Niemka? Are you German? Mom didn't see nothing. He took his rifle, turned it around. He said, beauty bear, I'm gonna kill you. By that time, when he was ready to kill mom, a Russian officer came. If you don't come right away, you have time to talk with the old woman, you're gonna get it. And he left us. We escaped. You get very diverse stories. The trek was, was ruthless. It was a tough trek. And there were more people sent back than got through. I was three years old. And my brother I have never seen. I didn't even know how he looks or something, or my father. When I think how my mother dragged me around in a war, there is diapers, there is food, there is this and that. But they cut us. Our goal had been simply to go west. Signs that the further west you got, the more the bombing by the Allies. And I was five years old. You know, from day to day, I mean, you needed some food to eat, you needed lodging, and usually that meant sleeping in the hayloft. The farmers, they were very good about it. My mom had a, a bag of dry beans, and that's basically all we had. And then for the meal, she would take a hand of dry beans here as your supper. And now we thought we had outrun the Russians. We were refugees without papers, without anything, without food. We were very, very scared that they would take us back to Russia. Well, the German people had to open their homes to, uh, to refugees. 
people didn't want any refugees. They had enough to take care of their own. We all spoke German and we were uh, considered Germans. Before long, they, the army was at our door and they drafted my dad. He had like five minutes to say goodbye to his family. They sent us to the front line, you know. The air froze my feet up. I was a year and a half in the hospital. Ich habe dann nicht offiziell und im Februar 45 wurde das Regiment versetzt wieder nach der Ostfront und da ging es durch Deutschland. Und da hat der Hauptmann gesagt, dass ich frei wäre. Ich wäre noch zu jung. Ich war ja noch eben 15 Jahre alt. As the war ended, it was uncertain how many of the Russian Mennonites that had fled Poland had been overrun by the Soviet army. Some had made it as far as the Netherlands, but most were in Germany, which was now defeated and being divided by the Allied powers. One thing that was certain for these Russian Mennonites was that they were powerless. They were now refugees. We eventually were occupied by American troops. Uh, then, uh, to our surprise, the Russians uh, took over. The Russian troops, they were extremely cruel. Die Frauen wurden nachts herausgeholt und vergewaltigt. Das, ich, ich würde sagen, ich habe zu der Zeit nie, niemals so einen vernünftigen, zuverlässigen Mann gesehen. So the soldiers arrived, knocked on the doors, and they were asking for the girls. You know, I had two sisters, but mom already hid them in the, in the attic. Says, you know, there's nobody here, and she was just frightened, right? Und da fängt der Russe immer wieder an zu kommen und wollte die Russlanddeutschen zurückholen. They had already uh, captured some and taken them out to Siberia. We didn't know yet that uh, the British and uh, the Americans had promised Stalin at the Yalta conference that all the people who had deserted their homeland, Russia, were to be returned. These were traitors. He wanted them back. They belonged to him. The Soviets were not well disposed towards Mennonites. They'd sent many thousands of them to the Gulag already. You were always afraid you would be the next one. When my mother heard trucks rolling down the street, she pushed us out the window at the back, and we crawled in to the windows of our German neighbors. They came three times to our village where we lived, and that old, nice mayor from that town, he says, Mrs. Dahl, I'm gonna send a boy and let you know we escaped. He went into the forest. Three times he came. The Russians had not yet uh, erected uh, watchtowers and all kinds of mechanisms to uh, keep people from leaving for the West. These guards, you know, they had shifts. And when they changed the shift, we got through by miracle. My father, sister, crossed the street she had younger children, three little children. They were packed up and they were sent. I never saw my mom again. She did the Russians catch her when the war was over. They sent her, she gave her 10 years prison. And then, eines Tages, hielt bei uns an der Straße ein Jeep stieg da ein Onkel raus und der grüßte Plattdeutsch und dann sagt er, ich bin CF Klassen. He wanted to get all the people that were around there come together. He wanted to talk to all of them. CF Klassen was a, a primary MCC administrator in Europe in the mid 40s. He was one who was able to move in uh, circles of high authority and move the program forward of trying to take care of marginalized people. 
the 1930s, there was even an idea that perhaps MCC should be disbanded because uh, the initial request for this temporary committee, an ad hoc committee, had been completed. But there was a desire to keep the committee together just in case another emergency, as someone said, would arise. In 1941, MCC established a presence in England. Peter Dick was one of the earliest workers. John Kaufman was another one of the earliest workers. They put out a call for two nurses, Elfrida Clausen from Winnipeg and Anna Hunsberger from Kitchener-Waterloo area. There was a lot of distribution of clothing from Canada and the U.S., some food, particularly where there had been a recent bombing. Peter and Alfreda were both of immigrant stock from Russia in Canada. They lived in South Russia during that emergency of the 1920s. In the middle of a bomb raid in England, uh, Peter asked uh, Alfreda Claussen to be his wife. They get married, then MCC sends them to Holland in, again, distributing food, clothing, in fact, one of the uh, phrases that MCC has become well known for is the phrase, in the name of Christ. That was a suggestion made by the MCC worker, John Kaufman, that people need to know the motivation for doing this. And then lo and behold, they hear about Mennonite refugees scattered all over Europe, eager to get into Holland. The Netherlands, sometimes successfully and sometimes unsuccessfully, the Dutch Mennonites were a small group that had stayed in Holland centuries earlier. At the end of the war, they negotiated to let Russian Mennonite refugees cross the border into the Netherlands. Over 400 would cross into the relative safety, but it soon became apparent to the Mennonite Central Committee that there were thousands more stranded in Germany, desperate to go anywhere but back east. They were also, like much of post-war Germany, hungry. We were always hungry. And MCC came with suitcases. They came with suitcases of sandwiches. Like in sandwiches, we hadn't had a sandwich for, I don't know, years probably. So we just gorge on sandwiches. This was like food from heaven. By 1946, MCC was working with almost a thousand refugees in numerous camps in the Netherlands and the non-Soviet occupied zones of West Germany. But by summer, it became clear that there were even more in Berlin. Berlin was a small enclave in the midst of Soviet control. The Berlin zone was very precarious because one block you could be in one zone, another block you could be in a different zone. The Soviet military was everywhere trying to find people to repatriate back into the Soviet Union. The British and the Americans, they realized what was going on, so they looked for ways of stopping that. What had happened is that Stinson, Lieutenant Colonel Stinson, had driven through the streets of Berlin one day with his aides and so on, and someone had said, look, sir, it looks as though there's some, some life down there. And he'd stopped the jeep, found these people in a bombed out house, all shattered. And that's how the telephone rang on my desk in Amsterdam, having gotten permission to drive through. And we went to Berlin and went down in there. And there they were, hiding, full of fear, no idea who I was. And when I saw that fear, and immediately the men got up and sort of almost like forming a little wall to protect women and children behind them. So I just reverted quickly to the Plattdeutsch, and I said, Guten Abend, actually Peter Dick, told them who I was, good evening, Mennonite Central Committee, and their mouths dropped open, and they were stunned, and they were overjoyed. and they all gathered around, and there was so much sharing and so much listening and talking and telling all their stories of the flight from Russia. Somehow, without telephones, the news did get around that there was a place in Berlin where Mennonites gathered. 
Het zei, mami zijn nu bij mijn kona. Hij zag de chips die voor door hand hier. Also als Flüchtlinge war, war ja eigentlich nie irgendwo Platz für uns. Dann einfach die Freude hier dürfen wir sein. And they got the one house after the other because more and more refugees came. We were over 1000 refugees in Berlin. Menace had a friend in the American military, but Menace now were also a problem. At one time, Lieutenant Colonel Stinson just says, enough is enough, and we can't keep doing this. They had set up bunk beds. Bunk beds, then a blanket separating, and then the next family. Well, it was crowded, to say the least. And the food came all from Holland. He had the ambulances full with food. On a daily basis, Dutch ambulances were traveling through the Soviet zones, including Berlin. They were picking up the thousands of sick and injured Dutch prisoners of war and laborers that had been taken during the war. Heading east, the ambulances were empty, so MCC packed them with food. Every Saturday, the kids got all a chocolate bar, which we actually didn't even know what it was in the beginning. But we were very happy to get that chocolate bar all the time. There were about 300 children, of course. You can't have a Mennonite group without school, so they organized school without any kinds of materials. We had every Sunday our worship service there, and there was a preacher, and people were singing. Aber wir bekamen auch die Flickerdecken, die die Frauenvereine da in Kanada nähen. Und da war überall das Schildchen drauf im Namen Christi. Und das war ein sichtbares Zeichen, dass es nicht nur schlechte Leute gibt, es gibt auch gute Leute. Und dahinter ist ein Gott. A lot of these people who came out of Russia as refugees These were traumatized people. They were people who were suffering psychologically, spiritually, emotionally. I don't even remember that Christmas program, but I know that's the first Christmas we celebrated. Peter and Elfrida, they, they were God sent. You know, they were a wonderful couple. They were always, uh, you know, no panic. They, they kept things in line. And Elfrida, I mean, she was such a gracious woman. Very lively young man. When he came, then everything lit up. Their hope was that they could go to Canada. We had ja auch Verwandte in Canada, die waren schon mal 26 ausgewandert. Aber das wurde annulliert. There were sick people, there were crippled people. Not every country wants to take uh, refugees like that. Some of them uh, had fought on one side and some had fought on the other side and some had collaborated, some hadn't. It was not uh, that they were all of one particular background or group. There was the Allied Council, and they met quite regularly to sort out all kinds of problems. Their policies in Germany of the Allies clearly diverged, right? You already have the Cold War, starting with 1946, more or less. But the Cold War is Washington, Moscow. You have the senior commanders. They're in a difficult situation to begin with. They socialize together to a considerable extent. And 
The, the American and Soviet generals got on very well. There was quite a bit of hard drinking. General Clay and others were quite hopeful that they could help these people get out. The Americans were always in favor of letting these people out. The Soviets were stuck with the Yalta Agreement, but Zhukov, Sokolovsky were far more interested in keeping things reasonably settled, re-establishing order. By early 1947, the Soviets were increasingly aware of the Mennonites in Germany and the Netherlands. Complicating the situation were 15,000 Dutch prisoners of war and laborers still in the Soviet zone needing to return home. The Dutch were under pressure to hand over the Mennonites or else. Everyone knew, including the Soviets, that the Mennonites were a problem in Berlin and they needed to solve this problem fast. The understanding was from the U.S. military in Berlin, find a country which will take these folks and arrange transportation. Then things would be set and the U.S. military could help to get these folks who were locked down inside the Russian zone, now uh, spilling into 1947. Where will we put these people? And a worldwide search went on. They, they looked at Alaska, they looked at Mexico tried all over the states and Canada said no. They all of a sudden they said, we have found a country that will accept you. Well, it turned out Paraguay said, if they're Mennonites, they can come. Then the next question was, well, how are we gonna get them there? C.F. Klassen, was, he was inquiring, where can we get ships? I remember all those meetings that we had and, and prayer meetings and and those times when they said we probably can move out here from Berlin and so on. And the Klassen was the man who said, God can. They lived by that. It became their motto. He always would say when they got so discouraged, God can. Well, they went to Holland. The Dutch queen, she was good enough to supply our Mennonite people with a ship. The first answer was, most of our ships are in the bottom of the ocean. They, they were sunk during the war. But uh, here is the Folendam. All of a sudden, they had a ship. A ship with capacity over 2,000 passengers. Then the plan arose to get them out by train, by freight train. To take all of us to go to Bremerhaven. Those that were in Holland would board the ship already and come to Bremerhaven, and we would be boarded there. But then was the problem of those in Berlin. Berlin was in sort of an island in the Red Sea. <laughs> the message came from Washington. The start is nice. You have permission to move the Russian Mennonites from Berlin through the Russian zone to Bremerhaven, provided that the Russians agree. Provided that the Russians agree I remember one time we were told to pack up, to be ready, but then it was called off because they didn't have the permission to go through the Russian sector. And but then, after said Frau Dück, es ist nicht eine Möglichkeit. There were various considerations. Is there any option to fly? There simply were not enough of planes, especially with the ship already contracted and waiting and ready to go. And many people prayed that had never prayed, as we were told, you know. And if we durften nicht mehr aus dem, aus dem Land hier raus, würden wieder doch wahrscheinlich in die russische Hände fallen. It was so, so emotional and so, so, uh, in a way, scary. Follendam, which has been hired for $350,000, ready to go to Paraguay. We had to make the decision, do we even send the boat half empty? But we decided we'd do that. And while we were just there and had just about finished, two American young men came marching onto the boat and came up to me and said, are you Dyke? I said, yes, come quickly. There's a message for you down below. Alfreda was in Berlin. Peter Dick was on Follendam. He was standing and holding. He says, Achtung. Achtung, bitte, bitte, 
still God is now going to do a miracle. The group from Berlin is coming. And then the first thought that came to us, I've got to get back to Berlin. Peter Dick took his car. He could go to the Russian zone. <laughs> Alfreda was in Berlin. She was given the notice that have your people ready at the street, packed and ready to go in an hour and a half. And we were half finished with supper. Everything stayed half eaten. And this was nighttime and we had to be quiet and of course the lights were out. Große Militärwagen uh, holten uns da von dem Lager ab und brachten uns zum Zug. General Clay, he had it all organized. He had the food in there, a stove in there, wood in there. When he was in the train, they closed the doors. And there was Stinson, our friend, ah, as happy as children at Christmas. And I ran to the end and got on, and there was Alfreda. Frida with the sick people and the old people. She's in the first car after the locomotive. That's the only passenger car, and we were off. There's 125 miles of hostile territory. The main point being, what happens if we get there and we get turned around? Are we going to have an incident? We didn't know. And the train moved slowly. Toward morning, when the sun was shining, the train stopped. We had all the fear there. Just for the had the Russians snapped. We could just look through the holes. It was all running around the Russian soldiers, you know. Officials in their big black coats inspecting the trains. Because you have these 45 boxcars, the Russians not knowing who's there, and they're stuck there at the border without permission to go. It was everybody was scared. There was uh, this feeling, will we get through? Will we get through? And the board had fallen down. And while I was still looking, hardly could believe my eyes, the light turned green. Whistles on that steam engine, and then the steam belched forward in the smoke and the wheels skidded on the frozen tracks and then slowly as they gripped, the train started to move forward. The train goes through and they get out of the Russian zone. Uh, a miracle is a term that uh, people used about that. And then it stopped and then Peter Dick came out, opened the doors, Boxcar doors were open up. We are free. And then I said, "I need to get in." And I said, A feeling that people knew we are through. We don't have to go back. And then was the last lied song. And then thank it all God. It was a very emotional moment. One little window of time, there was permission to go, and because these people had all been ready, they were expecting, they were there. When that little tiny window popped open, the train went through, and these folks were on the way to the Fallen Dam at, uh, at Bremerhaven. They the they had a goat drunk in your heart. And then I was left on your shrub. Then food. It may be that some of them were intoxicated. It may be that uh, Sokolovsky was intoxicated. But, you know, we, we've got this problem. How can we solve it? And women and children being thrown onto the trains and taken back. What would it look like? So I, I think one would hope that humanitarian considerations played a part. 
But I think you can also argue it was good geopolitics. It became known as the Berlin Miracle and captured international headlines. Man or life was that something. The biggest group, the Berliner group, they were free. It was amazing. We didn't have to be scared that the Russians would catch up to us. I had faith. I, uh, I, I was very content. And I'm so grateful that gratefulness never left me. Lives today. Blood shock. But it's a little change of the tree in the stove. And we young as we're on your palms. And <laughs> You know, the ship rocks one way and the hammer goes this way. And, and there was seasickness on the ship that you wouldn't believe. And da kam meine kleine Schwester. Ne, die ist vier Jahre jünger als ich. Aber wir sagten immer, wo ist Mama? Ich muss sterben. <laughs> And I was 14 years old. I thought it was great. And uh, babies were born, and also people died. Things happened. We had church. And we joined the, the choir. We had a big choir, Mr. Rampelwurst, the conductor. We became ja da auch noch kleiner, auch von meinem Sozien, diese Geschenken kleiner. And of course, they had to have school. We were kids. And as kids do, they, they, they look for fun, right? They don't take the world too serious. And we had actually a lot of fun on the ship. With the Soviet threat an ocean away, the refugees were content. But Paraguay was now going through a civil war. For the time being, Buenos Aires would be another temporary home. Then come the Argentina, all over the world. And they had on the walk and we walk. We were happy to see land again. There was a revolution in Paraguay. So we stayed in Argentina, in Buenos Aires, and we lived in a tent. Ging es unter Polizeiwachung jedes, jeden Tag dreimal zum Essen. Wir arbeiteten in der Küche. Als Mädchen. They made the Mennonites food. Oh, was that all good. So good wurden wir vom MCC aus betreut. Gab es eine Überschwemmung da, großer Regen. In den Zelten, alles um Italy. And there we had open church and so. And there I was baptized. What to do in, 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 in Buenos Aires? Uh, where could we get uh, lumber here? And the uh, sawmill, whatever, they could make the souls. By the hundreds, <laughs> to beat them. And then when they marched to, towards breakfast or lunch, or <laughs> these are some things that you know that you remember. We 
Und da war Onkel de Fier schon immer. Und die haben uns da sehr gut betreut. Onkel de Fier. Oh, that was a nice man. And, and, and Mrs. de Fier too. If there is a good general, there has to be a good wife behind him. C.A. de Fier, a businessman from Winnipeg, was one of MCC's negotiators in Paraguay who had been brought in to resolve a problem. After MCC made its commitment to, that these people would go to Paraguay, then the word came back that life was very hard. And it was. At that stage, Paraguay was very hard. And so that word got back. And so some in Germany said, we'll go to Paraguay, but we won't go to, to the Chaco. Mr. De Fier, he says, you know, to, to the MCC people, those people, they always been told that's what you can do, that's what you cannot do. But if they don't want to go to Chaco, we're going to buy a piece of property close to Asuncion, and they can settle down here. T.A. De Fair found this tract of land near Friesland. It was tropical forest, whereas the Chaco was desert. Nine months would pass in the tent village in Buenos Aires. Then, boarding riverboats, half would go to the Chaco, and half would go to the new colony in the southeast. The Paraguay government gave us land. It says, here's your land, and uh, good luck. <laughs> the Follendam colony was established. Follendam, which was named after the ship. Nothing, just bush. We had machetes, we had axes, and I think uh, we had two saws for one village. Like everybody was in the same boat, so to speak. Whereas we went to the charcoal, Eventually, we got to the colony. We, we stayed with people that had settled there in the 20s. First of all, a lot, a lot hotter and drier than the east was. It got to be 45 degrees Celsius. The first houses, the first were lame. They were then with feet and feet and feet. We uh, built the roads, we built schools, we built the church. Then we were so froh, als wir ein Dach über dem Kopf hatten. <laughs> <laughs> and we had our own house, our own home, and we were very thankful and very happy. Oranges, we had bananas, we had, uh, oh, grapefruit. So it was really a very fertile land. We had snakes, several kinds, but the rattlers were the, the scary ones. For us kids, it was fun, basically fun. But for the adults to, uh, to actually worry about having enough food for their family and are the crops going to do well, are we going to get rain, you know, for them it was very difficult. A settlement which was an attempt to re-establish people who had, who had been completely uprooted and had so much taken away from them. Fire stack table, ever go so. You were lucky if you had some grown sons or teenage sons, and they had to grow up very quickly, become men. Frauendorf, a ladies' village. Uh, mothers with kids, mostly. To this day, I remember the Saturday night prayer meetings. The church was full of widows and how they cried and prayed for all the ones that were left behind. And in many cases, they didn't know where their spouses were, uh, whether they were alive or dead, or some had remarried. Those prayers that came just from the, 
from the core. Those were tough times, but we were, we were free. And it didn't take long. I owned a horse. And then I learned how to rope. And most of us were, you know, walked barefoot. Uh, we couldn't afford shoes or some had sandals, but uh, kids all ran barefoot. It was not slave work. It was enthusiasm work. <laughs> when man heute solche Geschichten erzählt, dann kann man sich gar nicht mehr vorstellen, dass so etwas gewesen ist. We, we could really work hard all day and still come gather together in the evening and sing and play games because we were young <laughs> and free. We were so thankful. Nobody was shooting at us. We didn't have to run anymore. You didn't sense fear from your elders. Es gab es keine Uniform, keine Polizei, kein irgendein Soldat, weder ein Deutscher noch ein Russischer, noch ein irgendeine Idee. Keiner brauchte mehr Angst haben, um zu beten oder, zu, oder Gott zu danken. We had freedom of religion, we had freedom of our, in our schools. So it's a great story. But it's not the entire story. There were many others who managed to make their way to zones, the Western zones. So Peter and Elfrida both accompanied the first ship to Paraguay. And uh, the thought was that we had done it. Barely got back and they, and they said, oh, so many people have come forward. We've, we've got to have a second ship. And then a third and a fourth. Peter went to the United States to tell the story, to raise money, to pay for those ships. Alfreda sometimes barely had time to change her suitcase in Germany before there was another ship to be accompanied. She was the, to me really, the heroine of, the, of that story. And some were eventually allowed to come to Canada or under the, a program of family unification. Initially, Canada wouldn't accept any. Canada did allow some people to come if they had relatives in Canada. The second Volendam voyage in 1948 would stop in Canada, dropping off a group now allowed to immigrate. At that time, a Canadier group boarded wanting the autonomy that Paraguay had to offer. We moved for a while to the MCC camp near Stuttgart, where uh, for the first time in a long while, we met fellow Mennonites again. Got onto the Marine Tiger troop transporter. In 10 days, we were in Halifax. And from there, life proceeded in Canada. Of the post-war Russian refugees in Europe, over 5,000 would go to Paraguay and another 5,000 to Canada. Then, in the 1950s, Canada allowed many of those in Neuland and Volendam colonies to finally immigrate and join their relatives. Joseph Stalin would die in 1953. His totalitarian government had left millions starved, murdered, imprisoned, or exiled. How many were Mennonites is uncertain. It's hard to know. Statistics get increasingly difficult to, to get at. How many died in the Civil War, in the famines, in the purges? It's hard to tell. It's, it's just guessing. Historians have worked out that there were about 35,000 Mennonites that came out of Russia during or after the Second World War. Really, one should say Soviet, Stalinist, uh, communist, uh, you know, and not just Russian. 23,000, so two-thirds, were either 
caught in the Russian zone and sent back or extradited by the British and Americans. Many of them were sent into labor camps. 25 years later, my aunt and cousins, whom we lost during the trek, they came to Germany and we went to visit them. And I talked to my cousin. Oh, she said, hey, Henry, what we went through, you cannot even believe it. They caught us. They put us on a train. As we came to Tajikistan, some people died on the way. We lived in a forced labor camp. We had no rights, and there is no school. Go now and work. I was told that uh, half of us died of starvation, half of us. Wir denken noch sehr oft an solche Menschen, die nicht rüberkamen. Und äh, uns ist das noch keinen Tag. Wir haben heute noch darüber gesprochen. Leid, dass wir hergekommen sind. Na, Emma, Emma, danke. Ja, wir kennen ja nicht mehr viel, aber. So, das ist bloß noch Danke bei der Lust. Was sie hier durch die Welt gebracht haben, ist einfach unbelievable. Wir halten das auch für unsere Aufgabe, das in der Weise weiterzugeben, da wo wir können. I feel very much about refugees. Why? I was once too. Wir sind frei. Und dafür sind wir heute sehr, sehr dankbar.